I first met Steve Stone more than 10 years ago. It was at a wedding. He seemed unlike anyone I'd ever known. He danced with a sense of wild abandon. And he was determined to entertain and amuse. Shortly after meeting him, I asked if he would be willing to say the mourner's prayer at my father's memorial, a two-hour drive by car. I didn't know anyone else who could recite the Hebrew, and I wanted it to be a peer of mine instead of a contemporary of my father's. I also thought it fitting because my dad, a former psychiatrist, had spent the latter years of his practice helping gay men accept their gayness. Steve was gay. It was a perfect fit. And Steve agreed to do it without a moment's hesitation. For him, it was a great honor. Soon after arriving, I found him sprawled out on my father's bed, trying it on for size, I suppose. A walk with Steve would turn out to be a little bit of a walk on the wild side. Let's just say he's a character with more friends and in receipt of more invitations than I could ever hope to have. Getting to know him was to be a great adventure. and just say a couple of words for our little video. That's good, right here. Uh, what do you say, Roberta? Come over here. Okay. Stand back. Use the eye of the camera. Now. Okay. What do you got to say? Who is this about? It's about the... <laughs> it's all about me. What are you talking... Oh, I'm sorry. It's all about Rick and Candace. Oh, that's pretty. <laughs> it matches the, co the wedding color. Yeah, isn't that amazing? Mm. Look. All this purple. Oh, yeah, get under I didn't even great. know. <laughs> okay, Candace and Rick, this is for you. You are some couple. And I wish you all the best. All right, thanks for really. Give me a kiss. Mm -hmm. all right. so what's your name? Steve. I never kissed a man whose name I didn't know. Really? It's terrible. We did it after. I wish backwards. I could say the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess it's out of the bag now. <laughs> eccentric, maybe. You have a little odd. Maybe I'm too outspoken. Yeah, people get frightened by the totally open personality. They never know what to make of it because they're afraid to be open because of whatever happened, you know? So, who knows? But I don't border on insanity on any level. These are pictures that you took of me floating in the pool on a sunny Sunday afternoon. When I was younger, I had gorgeous hair. Guys would come up and touch my hair. It was like another feature about me that made me appealing and attractive up until my 30s. But then it went away. And what you have now is this <laughs> that I don't like looking at. We call this the hamburger head. I used to make fun of a guy who had this. And now I have it, this bald head. You know, it's, it's a narcissistic thing. We're getting older. We don't want to be reminded that we're older. I think it's natural in the aging process that I had my day in the sun. I had it. I had more than most people had in three lifetimes. In those days, the 70s, sex was everywhere. It was everywhere you went. Things are different now. being busy. I love doing more than one thing at a time. And I want to be in life as much as possible. And 
There's no one else to do it for me, so I have to keep moving. Aside from the pictures and a couple of things that I bought, everything in this house was from Flint, things he collected. This is Flint, Flint Harrison, my lover of nine years, the only lover. We met in Griffith Park in 1971, and um, he gave me his card, and I, I said, oh, I'm never going to see this guy again, and threw his card away. Eight years later, I was up in L.A. around midnight on a Sunday night, one o'clock in the morning, and I went to where the guys used to cruise around, and there he was, sitting on the fender of his pickup. Years later, he told me that he saw me walking and he sped up so he could get out of the car and uh, <laughs> be there waiting. He saw me walking, jumped out of the car, and sat on the fender so I could stroll by. He set that up. And we had our little tryst, and when we came out of the tryst, he put his arm across my shoulder and said, I'd like to get to know you. I started dating him for eight months, and one day, I just said, my stuff's up there, I'm sleeping here every night, I really don't feel like I know where I belong. And he said, well, just bring your things here, and that was it. And that's how I got him to invite me in. That was the house on Orlando in West Hollywood, where we had the most wonderful, that was where the love nest was. That's where all the fun took place, all the romance, all of the beautiful, sweet little things that people do when they're totally in love with each other. And, you know, it was more than sex, it was everything, and the sense of humor, the, the way he taught me how to appreciate beautiful things. And he just opened this whole new life, this high-end culture that was totally foreign to me. I mean, he was fantastic. He was, he was everything I never dreamed I wanted. Okay, so he made my life really easy. And all that mattered is that we were together. We did everything together, you know. Lifestyle and candles burning all the time and, and wine and it was wonderful, you know. So he gave me this beautiful, sweet life and he adored me. And the look on his face when I come up the walk and he'd be sitting on the front porch with the smile on his face and the little baby names he would call me. <laughs> Baby man, makes me cry thinking about it. But Trigger was the one I really liked. <laughs> he would say, come on, we're going to the flower mart. And I'd go, Flynn, it's 3 in the morning. So what? It's when they're open. You know, he'd drag me out of bed, and we'd run to the flower mart and buy orchids and stuff. And he wanted me to look beautiful. I mean, he gave me an American Express card. He gave me a shell card. He gave me that Eldorado convertible. We took several nice trips. He took me to Europe. And, you know, when I kissed him, it was like something changed. My life without him has never been the same, I will tell you has never been the same. That guy was one in a trillion. I mean, he was handsome, he was sexy, he was smart, he was funny, he was generous, kind, loving, devoted. I mean, 
and I was attracted to him. And you know, in gay life, everybody expresses their sexuality differently, and everyone's got a different form of expressing their sexuality. So you have to line up with what turns you on with what turns them on, and then hope everything else matches. Whether I would like Flint today, I pleaded with him to stop eating the meat. I pleaded with him to change his diet. I pleaded with him to start exercising. He wouldn't change. So who knows if I would meet him today, if he'd be the one. You know what I mean? I don't think I could live with a meat eater. I don't, I, I don't want that mentality sleeping with me. I don't mind what people, I don't judge people. And all of my friends, except a handful, eat animals. I can't not be friends with these people just because, in my opinion, they haven't evolved enough because I think it's an evolution. My parents didn't know how to handle me, and I wasn't a bad child, I was just I like to get the attention. If my teachers did things I didn't like, I knew how to make them very mad. Very mad. You know, I got kicked out of everything since I was three years old, starting with the supermarket, then nursery school, then kindergarten, then the third grade, then the garden club in sixth grade, and even Hebrew school. I asked so many questions at the first little meeting. She said, you're out before you're in. And that was the end of that. I was very hyper and very... Um, they didn't have medication in those days? I did. I used to take some kind of extract, this green medicine to try to calm me down. It never really worked, you know. I was just one of those kids that couldn't be stopped and was irreverent at a very young age. And my mother just gave up, basically. In kindergarten, Miss Gosh put me out in the hall one day and had my face in the corner, you know, the doorway, and then she had my face in the corner where the door jam met the wall, and, and I can hear, oh, Stone's out in the hall again, there he is, and they're all making fun of me, laughing, because I'm in the hall, standing with my nose in the corner, which was very humiliating. So she says, okay, Stephen, you can come in now, and she sits me down, and we're, we're on little mats, and she's reading a story, and I was really pissed at her, so as soon as she starts reading, my hand goes up in the air, and she goes, what is it, Stephen? I go, Miss Gosh, can I go back out in the hall? I liked it better out there. And besides, I've already heard the story you're reading. And she grabbed me by the shoulders and she shook me and shook me and shook me and my head's flying all. I mean, she would have been arrested today. But I was five years old. I made her, infuriated her at five. She told my mother I was the only student that ever made her lose her temper. I still have that self-centered nature that I, it's part of the shadow. I'm trying to watch it, but but I'm entertaining at the same time, so it it flies okay. I mean, I'm not self-centered in a way. I don't think that's totally self-absorbed, but I manage to do things to keep the energy focused on me in entertaining others. And I try to think what it is about my personality that has this ongoing need to be noticed. I probably need some more therapy to get that answer at 145 an hour, <laughs> which I can't afford right now. Hi. I wondered if you'd be willing to say a few words about your neighbor, Steve. Yeah, Steve Stone. Steve Stone. So it's kind of refreshing to have someone in the neighborhood that's a little bit unorthodox in a way and, and really very present, very, uh, very kind of provocative in, in a sense. I think some people don't understand Steve because he doesn't look for the kind of comfort level that, that a lot of people seek. He looks for kind of the excitement level. The first word that comes to mind is Stephen's exuberance. I think he demonstrates life exuberance pretty much more than anyone else I know. And another side of Stephen that I embrace fondly is his nine-year-old brattiness. Steve went with me and my very Christian right-wing brother and family, and at our lovely meals together, he would so managed to just wrangle <laughs> their values 
in his exuberant way, as only a nine-year-old brat can do. <laughs> My parents said, go out and play with the kids in the neighborhood. So the first kid I played with taught me how to masturbate. It's the first kid I met in the neighborhood. It came out that I was one of the school queers. I fell into those mannerisms and the entire ninth grade laughed at me. And it was the most humiliating experience I ever had. And I really felt bad that Judy had a, my twin sister Judy, witnessed that. Although she never mentioned a thing about it ever. My sister and I were very close. We played well together. We'd play house. We're very tight today. I mean, all I have to do is think about Judy and she'll call me. The first day of kindergarten, some kid pushed me in the playground and Judy decked him. And she said, you leave my brother alone. It was, oh yeah, five years old. You know, she was very protective. Like maybe I was a little bit of a sissy then too. Didn't know how to fight, you know. My sister took ballet in Miami when we were teenagers. The guy who ran the school told my mother that he needed boys in the class and he wouldn't charge her if she'd let me I wanted to really badly. I loved it. I thought it was the form of expression. You know, you, you were strong and flexible, and it was an art form. Plus, I had a feeling that he was gay. <laughs> so my mother said, oh, no, you can't do that. She said, men who do ballet in America are considered sissies. And uh, <laughs> I thought to myself, well, <laughs> but I didn't tell her that. And uh, I didn't get to do the ballet lessons. And between that and not letting me be on the swimming team did a great deal to actually destroy my motivation and my ego because those were the only two things I really wanted to do. Here I had something I really excelled at. And my mother didn't know how to accept me or to try to encourage the good things. My dad wanted me to have some sort of athletic inclination and I could have been a Mark Spitz, who knew? I was a really good swimmer then and my mother refused to let me participate in that. Why wouldn't she let you swim? Well, in 10th grade math, we had this teacher. He has the nerve to tell my mother that I'm the ringleader of the immoral group in the class. So she said, you're done with the swimming team. And that was it. She never let me swim. And I swim better today now than I ever swam. A half hour, four times a week, in the fast lane, 50 laps, of a 25 meter pool in under 30 minutes, which is good time. It's not the best, but for a guy 64. Was your mother affectionate with you? My mother hugged me all the time. My parents were very affectionate. They just didn't know how to deal with me. Up until the time when I became sexually active, my mother didn't know how to deal with that. She found a condom. Steve, I had to say to my mother, be adult mom. This is when I'm 17, be adult mom. That was my mother. I couldn't play with girls and I couldn't play with boys. What did she want me? Who was I going to play with? You know, my hamster, for God's sake. This gorgeous Catholic girl wanted to go out with me. I was going to get laid for sure. My mother wouldn't give me the car because she was Catholic. For God's sakes. She was in show business in the 20s. Prohibition, my father was 16. He was playing in speakeasies. You'd think they would have had more of a liberal attitude, but you know, what happens to people? You know, when she was dying of cancer, my sisters could not handle taking care of my mother. So I stayed home and I, you know, ironed and cooked and I made the meals for us and took care of my mother, was there all day. And when someone called one night, I picked up the extension, he says, so how are the kids, Jeanette? And all she said was, well, Steve's a disappointment. And I'm the one taking care of her. She screamed at me once, your father had to die and leave me with you. The thing is, I got my ego back, you know, I got it back. I got through high school. I didn't have too many incidents when I got into high school. I had some really great friends, and I left. Went to gay bars. When you're around where you live, it's a whole different feeling. It's easier to be in an environment where nobody knows you, to get away from the prejudices and the narrow-minded thinking. And I had colitis. It kept me out of the army. I had a spastic colon. I was taking Daracon, Colace, Valium. Librium, mineral oil, and metamucil every day. I was a nervous wreck because I, I was internalizing my sexuality. And I was so uptight about it. I was, you know, blinking and twitching, and I was always doing all, it was a mess. Most of them have gone away, except a little tick in the eye every now and then when I get kind of excited. Really pissed. 
I come in there all the time. Just what I need is to get home and not have the one thing I went to the store for. The one thing. That was why I came in there was for this chocolate. Right. Well, do I get mad? I sure do. I can feel it now more than ever when I'm mad. But it's just hard to stop once you're steamed up. I came there for a specific reason. I'm really upset. Hello. Hi, Bruce. How was your good boy? You good boy? I get um, no preservatives. They didn't have the organic, but um, I guess no preservatives. This is close to organic as you can get for a month. So I cook this up with water and I get this chicken broth flavor. And I use that in this kibble for, you know, days and days. Hi, hey baby. I love you. I love you. Of course I love you. You love me too, Buzz. So how long have you had Buzz all together? I don't know. Six years, eight years. More like eight. What a lucky strike that was for you, Buzzy boy. You found a dog lover. Bella and Edith were rescues of about 14 years ago. They were my two dogs for a long time until Buzz came along. And, uh, Bella was hit and run, leg was smashed, and Edith was brought in from a rescue person. I had him about 13 years, and Edith got lymphoma, and then one day she fell in the pool, and then I decided that was the end. So I wanted her name read in Temple. And I called up for Friday night, and I said, um, my dog died, and I'd like to know if you could mention her name. And so the girl on the phone said, well, I don't think it's really appropriate if we name dogs. So I said, OK, and I hung up. And I called back the next day, and I said that my aunt died. <laughs> and I'd like her name read in Temple. And they said, OK. And I said, her name is Edith Schleifstein. That was my family name before it was changed to Stone in 1933. So got her name read in Temple. I was there and stood up and said Kaddish. When Bella died four months later, I did the same thing. My other aunt, Bella Schleifstein. I, I was just a mess. I had Buzz. He was here, thank goodness. But uh, that's life with dogs. You have to accept it. In the relationship that we have had, we still have. It's just different. He taught me how to love and be loved. And I knew, we were driving down Santa Monica Boulevard once and we saw these two old guys walking together and he said, that's gonna be us one day. And a little voice said to me, that's not gonna happen. And I knew that uh, something was gonna happen. I didn't know what. And I had the feeling that whatever we had something was going to happen. We were not going to grow old together. So what happened? Well, he got AIDS and died. Woke up one night in, in night sweats, and, uh, and I covered him in bath sheets, and I went downstairs and put my head in a dish towel. And realized that he wasn't going to make it. I did everything I could to keep him alive, you know. I fed him living foods in the hospital, and he was healthier in the hospital than he would have been on their IV stuff. You know, I mean, he looked good, he had color in his face, he rested, he wasn't in pain, he was in good condition for a guy that was dying. <laughs> if that makes any sense, you know, I did everything, I did everything I could to keep him alive. And what happened was, all the things I found out for him, I do today for myself, as if I was sick, which I'm not. I'm HIV negative, and I grow wheatgrass, and I drink the Rejuvalac enzyme water, and I make the blended nourishment to reinforce the immune system and keep it strong with high vitality. I mean, I know this secret. It's a secret that's available, but most people don't really want to know about it. It'll be 21 years on January the 11th.
died upstairs. Not easy. Well, he drops in. I get to see him every now and then. Whenever it happens, I wake up feeling that I just had an opportunity to see him again, if only in the dream. I had a series of three where one dream, we were in the house, and I said to him, when are you coming home? And he goes, and the second night, he was there, and I said, aren't you coming home for dinner? And he said, I have to go soon. And the third night, it was a dream where he's walking up a narrow staircase with his hands behind him, and I'm holding on, and we're walking up the staircase, and I start sobbing, and I say, you've got to stop this. And we get up to this platform, and that's when I let go, and he walked off into this orange and white mist and just walked away, you know? It's very sweet, very sweet. I had a vegetarian nurse here with me when Flint was very sick and dying. And she started talking about factory farms and I had never heard of a factory farm. So once I became aware of what goes on with these animals on these farms, from the time they're born to the time their throats are cut, I could no longer eat animals, just on that level. Regardless of the environmental impact and the moral issue, which is what I'm concerned with, and the, the health issue with antibiotics and steroids and herbicides and pesticides, and the spiritual side, because you're eating flesh that has been tortured and brutalized and racked with fear uh, its whole life, so those energies on an ethereal level are in the flesh that people are eating. And that has to get into their system. And on a subtle level, that's what I think helps promote violence. Right, Buzz? Mm -hmm. The house that Flint bought for us in 1988, he died shortly thereafter, is filled with beautiful things in every room. Chinese, Japanese, mostly of the Asian oriental flavor because that's what he liked. And our furniture really has that influence with grass cloths from the Philippines, and the bamboos and reeds, he loved that stuff. And when he died, he gave me this beautiful furniture company with a wonderful reputation. So I became a different person overnight. I moved to California in 71 to buy a radio station and that deal didn't happen. And then we tried another thing with a foreground music service and that didn't happen. And then I started my little closet business and that didn't happen. Now, with the opportunity that I was given, you know, I walked into a business with 22 employees. They didn't let me do anything. I was, you know, this boss. Instead of being the lover, boyfriend, I'm now the one who owns this company. Everyone thinks I know about interior design. They think I know about style. They think I can answer all their questions. Couldn't answer their questions. But now I can, after 21 years, you know. So uh, that business transformed me into a business person. We are at the top of the high-end custom furniture market. Our coffee tables list for about six or $7,000. All of this hand turning here, see? It's totally custom made. Appreciate it. Have a nice weekend. Nico, thank you. John, I won't kiss you, I'll just give you a check. That'll do. Or hey. The financial issues around my business are always with me. I have to worry about loans, I have to worry about taxes, I have to worry about payroll, I have to worry about promoting the business, making money, keeping my house. This is a daily occurrence with money. And anyone in small business in America, it's difficult enough, you know? In the last four years, the sales have never been consistently high enough. So if I have a 60, 70, or $80,000 a month sale, I'm fine. When I drop down to 20 or 30, I'm in trouble. And if it goes on for a period of months, you're deeper in the hole. That's how business operates. Uh, downward, then they, they look like the average person can't really appreciate the intense loyalty I have from these craftsmen. I ask their opinion when I have to do quotes, and we work like a family unit. 
There are other businessmen who probably would run a tighter ship. They would probably make more money, but it took me a long time to catch on to a lot of things because I'm basically an airhead and money was never important to me. You know, I was smoking pot and drinking before I got into AA and I let the, uh, the bookkeeper steal $200,000, which ended up costing me a million when I extrapolated all this stuff around it that I had to come up with, that he should have paid, that he didn't pay, that he was being paid. At that point, I was debt free. My credit score was 803. I was on top of the world and I tempted the gods. I walked to the factory and I said to my foreman, well, Hoovenal, we're making money. Orders are coming out on time and we've got the office organized. What could possibly screw this up? And a week later, the place burned to the ground. Got an insurance policy and I trusted the agent to give me what I told him I wanted. A year and a half after the policy, we had this fire that was started by a roofer. They sued me turn it around so you look like you were partially at fault. I'd never written an insurance policy before, and I should have asked somebody, should have asked my lawyer to read it, I mean, anybody. So I should have gotten 212,000, I got 30,000. So we're fighting in court over the difference between that now. And I'm still in that hole six years later, deeper than I ever thought I'd ever be. And I'm struggling to keep that business going because my relationship with the business and with the house keeps that part of Flint alive. The company was his. He started it from one table. He made it in his kitchen early in the 70s. And the house that he bought for us here. So I am always in a constant state of this narrow space. But we call it in Hebrew Mitzrayim, and it's always we never know whether we're here or there. There's always the chance that everything could slip away. That I would have to close the business, sell the business, lose the business, walk away from the house. I'm a member of a congregation called Temple Israel of Hollywood. It's a beautiful reformed congregation, I think the oldest in Hollywood, in LA. And uh, two years ago, a new cantor, a new Hazan joined us. He was a Zen Buddhist for 15 years, and then the, his Zen master said, it's time to go back to your Judaism. And he was showing us how everything we look for and all these other outside beliefs exist in Judaism. And he said things that changed my relationship with God, who we call Hashem. He said how God is always with him. Once he said how he feels, and I got it, I brought it into my life as well. And I am connected in my heart with that energy. That's true, Steve. Why do you have your little fits, which you do have from time to time? You mean, why do I get angry? You know, I'm not like Confucius or the Buddha. I don't sit around all day in a, in a lotus position and people bring me fruit. I have to go to work. I have to deal with people screaming and yelling. The political world and my own real world with mortgage payments and all this stuff. The point is, with all the pressures and the grief and the disappointments and the loss, and difficulties in day-to-day -day living, what holds me together is the fact that I know that Hashem is a part of me now. I'm never gonna lose that. I get a phone call and I hear, 
Stephen Stone? I go, yes, I am your cousin Roman Rockover, and I want to meet you. I said, well, okay. Now, Roman is from Poland. He and his mother and father escaped before the Nazis. He went back looking for his brother and got caught. And he spent four and a half years in a slave labor camp. And I go meet him. And I figure, oh, I'm gay. I'm not very Jewish. You know, he doesn't accept me. He's not going to like me. And, and he was difficult, little. He, Roman was a little narrow minded and opinionated, but he kept inviting me over and stuff with he and his wife. And uh, he wrote this book on our family, a genealogy, starting at about 1600 in Krakow and located 700 relatives. He's connecting with me. His wife dies. I did something for him at the funeral. And I'm sitting in the back. He comes back. He says, Stephen, you're Mishpucha. You belong up front with us. So I moved to the front row. And he sits next to me. I put my arm around him. And I held him close for the whole service. And it was really important. It was important for him. And he told my sisters, oh, your brother's such a mensch, you know. All I did was love him at that time when his wife died. So one day he calls me up and he says, Stephen, it's Yontif. That means it's Yom Kippur. It's Yontif. You can come say Yusker for your parents with me today. They blow the show for at 7. Why don't you come at 4? I showed up at 4. The next year, why don't you come at 1? I came at 1. The third year, why don't you come at 11? So here's this fifth year, the end of the service. They're blessing the children. He says, come on, Stephen, they're going to bless the children. I said, Roman, I'm 52 years old. You know, don't you think this is a little late? He says, what's the matter? You can't be blessed. So on the way up, I realize he's walking me through all these things that my parents didn't do. He's fulfilling his responsibility to bring me back to Judaism. We're walking right under where the rabbi is standing. And I, over my shoulder, I say, what's next, my bar mitzvah? And there it was. You know, I realized that in order for me to be a Jew in the world, I needed to honor the 176 relatives that that book mentions were tortured and murdered by Hitler in World War II. My entire family that was in Poland for 350 years was wiped out. And I thought I had a responsibility and an obligation to honor them, and that was when I decided to have the bar mitzvah. And that was in about 1998, and two and a half years later, in the summer of 2000, 13 of us in a class at Temple Israel of Hollywood had our bar mitzvah. It was sweet. us for parking. How many are you inviting? And this one says, I've got three, I've got 12, I've got seven. When it came to me, I said, I have a hundred. Because <laughs> I went to everybody else's bar mitzvah, so they came from, from all over. I do get emotional. It's, uh, I finally had a talus that I carried a temple. and. Uh, I had my reception at the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel overlooking Grauman's Chinese Theater. And seeing as that I live on the Hollywood Hills, it was just perfect. Now, who needs to be circumcised? I have an extra night. I, we got a few minutes before the... Today, with Stephen, and celebrate his beautiful bar mitzvah at year 54. Now, I wish him 55 on it. Okay. <laughs> He has also self-confidence, what he was lacking before, right? Right. Okay. And now he's on the right way. I think I can start taking care of him because he can do by himself. Amen. Thank you. This is my twin sister, Julia. I can't think of anybody that has a larger heart and sense of generosity than my brother. We have a special connection. I don't know what it is, maybe that twin thing, but it's not so tough. Happy Barbitzbach to me. Roman got sick. 
I get a call saying, Steve, we need your help. And they are 25 miles away up the freeway. And, and I run up there, and he's in the bed downstairs. The day before he's going to the hospital, he has to talk to me. You know, Stephen, I know you have a different lifestyle, and I want you to know that I love you dearly, and I accept you. When he died, I didn't get anything of religious significance, but I was his only blood relative here, and I was devoted. I saw him every day at the hospital for three months. I went every day after work. Not even the talus and the, or the religious things or anything did he mention me in that will. What I understood was that he, too, never really accepted me. But, you know, the gift that he gave me was that he did bring me back. He did take five years, gradually. And I suppose the gift I got was the life that I have today in my synagogue, which you can't put a price on. You know, I never felt I had a place in Judaism. I didn't think there was a place in a synagogue for me being gay. And when I got there, I realized, I mean, they have gay baby namings now in synagogues. I was just so thrilled when I realized how many things have changed, how times have changed. So I found a place in my Judaism being a gay Jewish man. fulfilling the Jewish edict to repair the world. I do what I can do to help those who can't help themselves, who need an advocate. I show up. I carried a lot of my friends right to the grave. I was there for them during the 80s. I support PETA, Greenpeace, Last Chance for Animals. It's not like I'm UNICEF, you know, I'm just a little guy. <laughs> Stephen was at the forefront before it ever became chic, gray watering. He was doing all of these things before most people even had an inkling it was something that they could be considering. And I worked in the field of AIDS for many years, so we cross over there because he helped so many people. Steve was a wonderful collaborator when we negotiated with Universal Studios. Had a great sense of conscience, protecting the neighborhood from the kinds of development that Universal was doing. And we were very successful in it, and I think in large part due to his efforts. I live with this feeling of being in this wonderful little place that he left me, but I spend most of my time alone. Even though I try to keep optimistic, I have to tell myself I'm probably going to stay a single guy. I'm not a simple person anymore. You know, when you have 15 years of exposure to the ideas of Jung and all those psychological things, it's very important to me in my life. And you become a different person psychologically. This vegetarian, compassionate lifestyle separates me. Then there is the fact that I'm a recovering alcoholic. I'm in sobriety, I don't drink. And I'm an entrepreneur. And that separates me from a lot of people in how I view the sense of responsibility and dedication and a commitment. Everyone takes off, you know, they don't want what I have. I used to have this feeling that there was a turnstile at the back door and it would keep turning until I found someone that I kind of liked and then I would lock the turnstile and then they would burn out or I'd burn out and then I would take the lock out and start the turnstile again. And that's been going on for about, you know, 20 years. Because the other stuff steps in soon, <laughs> there you are, alone. Isolated. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Okay. Tell us what's up. I think we're ready. The world's so best you. waiter. He's wonderful <laughs> because he's attentive. He knows exactly what you want. Did you get the dimples? He's got adorable dimples. My friends have told me, you have the libido of a 35-year-old. With the internet being the venue of today, I go in there looking, figuring one day someone's going to stroll by, just like on the street, 
and they're going to stick around. I have this obsession with cruising online at work. There's a stimulation with just looking, and I appreciate that. So part of my sublimation of a pretty powerful sex drive is now looking at pictures of guys who look like what I used to get all the time. <laughs> Hoping it's going to change, but it's not. <laughs> we know better. <laughs> An obsession for something can blind us, when it, especially when it's driven by an archetype, which are these strong images in the unconscious, which just take us over until we can get a hold of it. What's the strong image? The phallus. <laughs> Do you see any contradiction between your promiscuous gay lifestyle and your Jewish identity? One thing does not have anything to do with the other. How I live my life and what I do for myself for sexual gratification has nothing to do with my relationship to the God of my people. And I am made in God's image like everyone. The dark side, the darkest of sides, the most beautiful of sides. It doesn't matter about who you have relationships with, with another human being. Your relationship with God is totally its own relationship. See, my definition of morality is any behavior between two or more people where everyone agrees in that activity. Everything being voluntary between all people involved, then it's moral. Oh boy. Well, in case you haven't guessed, this is the story of a gay, Jewish, recovering, alcoholic, vegetarian, animal rights uh, individual. Meaning of life is to love and be loved. And that's what it is to me. That energy it makes everything okay. That energy supports you when you're down. It makes you feel even better when you're up. I mean, how anyone can live without love in their life is that's what it is. The whole meaning of life is loving and being loved. Now, because Flint dying, that was his path. That's not my path. That was his path. I just walked alongside of him for a while, you know, and he was gracious enough to give me everything he had when he left, as opposed to anybody else gave it to me. So my path is pretty blessed. So the purpose of my life is to learn to do better, learn to do more. I ask God every morning, help me be a better person today. Help me to recover my business so I can be honorable in my affairs. Sometimes I wonder about the power of prayer, but there's no way I can live without God. I can't do it. Will the circle be unbroken by and by, Lord, by and by? That's a sweet song. It talks about the hearse that's coming to take his mother away. That's what gospel music's about, isn't it? It's about going back to heaven. He tells the driver of the hearse to go slowly. It's emotional because he doesn't want to let go of his mother yet. That last night I did get into bed and held him and played Billy Holiday, which he really liked. Loved her. I'm sorry. Anyhow, 7 o'clock in the morning on January the 11th, he stopped breathing. And so I got to witness that. The two last breaths. There was one and then another one, and then it was over. I guess that's what happened. <laughs> I still cry for that man at night. I talk to him at night.
I've been watching romance movies with happy endings for a very long time, and then I realized that they were a vehicle for me. In a sense, I'm having a relationship with the male in the movie. Sometimes I am riveted with emotion because my own things come up for me. The longing for Flint and how much I miss him. I stay connected that way as well. I had a situation recently with someone who I met. The first time we spent together was beyond belief. It was magical. And because of holding on to Flint, I allowed myself to say something to this person that was rude, inappropriate, and ended any hope of something that might have happened because I got impatient and I got a little arrogant and I did it because I didn't want anybody coming between me and this memory that is still alive and walks around with me. That's what I did to sabotage something I could have had in this world for something I'm holding on to that's in the other world. Could something good come of letting go of everything you have? Yeah, maybe that's what I need to shake me loose. It could be a chance for you for some kind of transformation, like from cocoon to butterfly. Do they have gay butterflies? I've been in the hole for at least four years to the tune of about one and a half million dollars. If I have to leave this house, my life will change. My whole image of myself will change. And the identification with myself and my environment will change. I have to walk into an apartment house going to change. I don't want to think about how it's going to change because it's overwhelming. I have to say, it was a mistake not selling this house two years ago and getting my price and wiping out a lot of the overhead that I have with this house. It would have left me with money in my pocket instead of the situation now where I'm gonna probably just break even and walk out of here. So yeah, I've made a lot of bad mistakes when it comes to decisions because emotion got in the way. There was no one here to talk to me about it. I would prefer to be carried out feet first like he was. That's how I wanna leave this place, feet first, not in a moving van, in a hearse. <laughs> That's how I wanna leave here. I don't know if that's going to happen. Well, Rosh Hashanah is the new year. That's when we celebrate the turning of our calendar. And then the week later, we have Yom Kippur. And this is a time when we correct the wrongs we've made as we walk up to that point where we are going to be forgiven for things that we have done that weren't right. You can call them sins, transgressions, approach people you have wronged. You make your amends and you get to start over with a new slate every year. I don't know of anyone that I have actually wronged that I need to apologize to. I've actually been working on apologizing to myself for things I've done that have hurt me. And that's the hardest thing to do, actually, because you have to look in that psychological mirror and you have to admit to yourself, you did this to yourself. You know, you, you made these mistakes. In the last few weeks, I've been struggling with God. I was feeling so upset about all this struggle that I thought I was damned. That's what I was saying to God, why am I damned? 
So I'm in Temple and I just closed my eyes and all of a sudden I saw myself in the sand, in the sun, with just a cloth around my middle, naked in the desert, with my head down, kneeling before this huge cloud. And at that moment, I knew I was blessed to have had this experience. I was kneeling before God. God was right there. So that was a gift, that I had this opportunity to humble myself before God. So now I've been renewed again. And since that happened, my business has been picking up. Didn't get the lottery ticket yet, which would solve everything, but in some way I'm being helped out. I do continue to have faith. Although I see myself somewhat as the Job person in the Bible, where Lucifer said he could get Job to lose his faith, and Hashem said, no, he will not. And even though Job was stripped to the rock bottom of life, he never lost his faith and he got it all back. And that's the thing that I carry in my heart. I have faith, I'm working hard, and I will continue to recover again.